Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. They said we're gonna put a play together Though we don't know yet what it's about We'll let everybody be in it So that there's no one left to be in the crowd No, you think I'm wasting time here Not sculpting up an image to play This is my last letter Welcome, everybody, to the next episode of Shumacast. I am Noel, joined, as always, by Angie. Hey, everybody. And we have a special bonus episode that we're dropping into the timeline, where before we get to Batman Forever, that is right, we are at the <laughs> Joel Schumacher Batman films. Finally. Finally. <laughs> We decided to take a step back and look at what was leading into the Batman films by Joel Schumacher. So we're looking at Tim Burton's Batman, yes. Tim Burton's Batman Returns, and also taking a little look at the 1960s Batman movie, just because that's obviously what they were going for with the Joel Schumacher era. Right. Before we start, let's just talk about the character of Batman himself. What is your overall history and experience with that character? Oh, my goodness. Where to start? Right, exactly. I mean, I think like a lot of people our age, probably the Tim Burton movies were the first time I was really aware of him. I'm sure, you know, I mean, he's kind of everywhere. You always know who Batman is as long as you've grown up in America, at least. I remember, you know, when the first one came out, it was such a big deal. Oh, so many people. And it was like, I finally watched it. And okay, okay. And then it was really, I think, to me, when I truly became a fan of Batman was when Batman the Animated Series came out. Just absolutely fell in love with that show. Eventually started reading some of the comics around that time. Whenever they finally added FX as a station, that was when I first saw the <laughs> 1960 series and checked that out. It's hard not to have Batman as a part of, but I feel like if you're going to ask me what my Batman is, it's the animated series Batman. Absolutely. Very similar to that. The only difference is I saw the Adam West series first. Mm -hmm. Back in the 80s, that was still syndicating on a lot of local networks. Mm -hmm. Actually, my very first Superman was George Reeve, which was syndicating on Nick at Night at the time. Mm, yeah. Or actually, that was during the day on Nickelodeon, because during the day, Nickelodeon would play like Dennis the Menace, Lassie, Superman, a few things. Yes, I remember that. That was before they started their big push of original programming going into the 90s. Mm -hmm. So my very first Batman was Adam West. I watched those so much, my dad taped every single episode. <laughs> and so we had the entire series logged on videotape. Gotcha. I know I watched those up until the early 90s. And yeah, mm -hmm. 1989... Batmania. <laughs> my dad was a local film critic and reporter for one of the local newspapers, among his many other careers, and got us into the local premiere press screening oh, wow. of the film. So it was like me, my cousin, shout out to Eric Busher, who's an improv comedian in the New York area. He was in town. It was like local celebrities like Buster Poindexter and Jesse Ventura were in attendance. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a big spectacle. And it's like, God, I remember that whole era of the action figures. There were so many tie-ins. I would have been mm. like seven. So I was like eating it up. Right. I know yeah. I bought my mom a pair of Batman symbol earrings, which she never wore <laughs> ever. I wonder if they're the ones that I have. <laughs> they might be. Are they the ones where it's like there's a circle around the logo separately? It's mostly, I think, like big yellow circle. Maybe there is a logo. And then the logo in the middle. I also have ones that one side is the Joker and then the other is ha ha ha. No, yeah. This one, it would be like a brass ring. And then in the middle of it, hanging independently is the logo. So it was kind of like the ring and the logo. Would oh, okay. Really, yeah, was, so no, that's different. It was even gaudier, exactly what a seven-year-old who had just seen the Batman movie would buy for his mother. Right. And then I remember they bought me one of the Batman action figures. I broke it in a day and then they bought me mm. a new one. <laughs> Was it just regular Batman or was it like, you know, snow leopard Batman? <laughs> no, this was the regular Batman where it's like you pull out his belt and his belt is actually the grappling hook with a string that's attached to a coil yes, inside. I think we had that one. I overdid that in one day and like snapped the string <laughs> and it like all spooled into mm. it. And I'm like, what now? <laughs> 
But yeah, I mean, there was Batmania, and then, of course, almost immediately afterwards was Batman the Animated Series, Mm -hmm. which really sucked me into the character. And that was probably the biggest point where I was involved in the character. And the only run of the comics I ever really read was that Nightfall era. Yes. With Bane and everything that happened in Mm -hmm. the 90s. It's like, I had no idea what led up to any of this, but it was the big popular story at the time. Right. I was almost a little more into the Death of Superman stuff. Like, the Death of Superman Mm -hmm. and Return of Superman, I read all of that okay nightfall i kind of read chunks of it Mm -hmm. because my dad also at the time working in a comic shop so i'd see a lot of the issues as they were coming out and so it's like i read like the big bane confrontation with the backbreaking and all that stuff Mm -hmm. and then i kind of sporadically chipped in i'm like wait there's a new guy in armor now wait he's fighting dick grayson (laughs) and then batman comes back and and stuff like that and i never got fully pulled into it and i've never really read much of the comic since like i've read killing joke i've read dark knight returns but i've never Mm -hmm. actually sat down and explored the Batman comics. And I've never really followed much of the other, like, I kind of fell out of the cartoons around the time they did the big redesign. Yeah, yeah, I didn't care for that as much. Yeah, I didn't care for that as much. I liked Batman Beyond. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like, I fell out of the cartoons, they were going into the Justice League era. Not that the Justice League was bad, it was just my interests were elsewhere. Right. And I've seen all the films, like, I've seen all the Nolan films, I've seen all the Mm -hmm. Snyder films, I've seen Gotham. I like Gotham. I dropped out of that about after, I think, the first season. Oh, season two is so fun. I've seen the first three seasons. I'm a little behind in it, but I am still watching. I just finished season three like Mm. two months ago. Batman is a very interesting character. What what do you think about Mm -hmm. the Batman character as a cultural thing? I guess the fascinating thing about him is that he can be whatever you want him to be, really. Like, we've seen so many different versions now. I do really like the detective aspect of it. The Batman video games they came out with in the 2000s were really great from that perspective of getting you to do the detective work. I like him as the guy who's hanging out with all these superpowered people, but he's the smartest person in the room and possibly Mm -hmm. also the most dedicated. And so that's why he's still able to make it work, even though he's just, quote unquote, an ordinary guy. But, you know, he can also be silly or he can also just be a bit of a bruiser or I mean, there's just so many different things to him that I think it's interesting that they can all still work a lot of ways. Yeah, I think what's interesting about him is they definitely take the pulp male fantasy. Mm -hmm. He's rich. He's a bachelor who has all these girlfriends. He can do whatever he wants. He's an expert chemist and engineer and the best (laughs) detective in the world, the best fighter in the world, smartest guy in the room. Mm -hmm. And they make it sad. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And yet he's this person who's just so hung up over the death of his parents, which I don't Mm -hmm. say critically, but the fact that he is so driven to go in such an outlandish way route to try to fix his broken city. Mm -hmm. That is a quest that's pretty much doomed to just repeat until he dies and never fully succeed. Right. He's basically branded this legacy image, this iconography of the bat. Mm -hmm. It's kind of fascinating in that it's almost a subversion of the pulp male fantasy while also still being a pulp male fantasy. Mm -hmm. I would never want to actually be Bruce Wayne because that's a very (laughs) sad lonely, hollow shell. Depressing. (laughs) Where it's, he's perfected himself as a person because he's so wrought in grief. Mm -hmm. Punisher is like the extreme example of that. Right. I do appreciate it's best when he does have Robin and Nightwing and that support group with him. Because yeah, like solo Batman is so, whoo, yeah. (laughs) I like the family that he's built. Yeah. That's something that I thought the animated series did good at gradually building that family around him. Mm -hmm. Like, I like a Batman who can cut loose and have a sense of humor, even though his entire life is still dedicated to this cause that's driven by his grief. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting character. And yeah, as you said, a character that can be explored in so many ways and so many tones. There's the light comedic versions. There's the extremely dark versions. There's the character studies. There's Mm -hmm. the crime dramas, the detective thriller, the ninja stories, you know, there's yeah. so many things that you can just stick Batman in and explore in ways that, yeah, that's what Batman would do. <laughs> <laughs> right. Unless you're Neil Adams and it just gets weird. <laughs> He is a very interesting character that I've always meant to explore more, but my God, is there a lot of him? There's very much a lot. Yeah. Talking about, because I know you appreciate novelizations and things like that. Mm -hmm. I actually read a novelization of Nightfall. That was my main exposure to that story because I was a little late to the comics. Didn't Denny O'Neill write that? He may have. It's been a long time. I may have got it from the library, so I don't think I have (laughs) a copy anymore. (laughs) 
But then I also had a book, which is definitely out of print, called The Further Adventures of Batman, which was just all kinds of different writers just doing these little short stories. And it was just fantastic of the range of different stories they explored and different aspects of them. Just really, really good. Yeah. I never read the Nightfall. I read the, uh, mm-hmm. that was the interesting thing was where not only did we have these gigantic DC events that happened around the same time, but they novelized yeah. them. They did radio adaptations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I never read Nightfall, but I did read the Death and Return of Superman by Roger Stern adaptation. Okay. I would like to read that. Then yeah, yeah, that anthology of just, mm-hmm. here's Batman, do what you want. Right. Because I remember there were there were anthologies about Wonder Woman and Superman at the same time, too. Yeah. And I think they did follow-ups of Joker and Catwoman, Ooh. but I haven't gotten my hands on those since they're out of print. They're a lot harder to find now. Yeah. 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 Let's go ahead and just start rolling into things. Sure. I'm guessing neither of us have ever seen the 1930s or 40s film serial version of Batman. I actually did watch oh, hey. the serials. They're very racist. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's the main thing I kind of took from them, unfortunately. It's pretty cringeworthy. Story-wise, not particularly exciting. It's got the pretty standard format for the time period. It's been a while since I watched them, but yeah, that's my main takeaway of, ooh, okay, has not aged well, gotcha. I always saw pictures of those floppy ears, Mm. and not sold. Yeah. (laughs) Film serials as a whole are something I've I mean, my Tarzan podcast is probably the most I've ever gotten into film serials. <laughs> Maybe we can link to my reviews that I did on my blog at the time. Oh, that's right. I remember, yeah, you did a review series back in the day. Because I did cover them then, and I probably had much more depth analysis when I could actually remember what I watched. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we'll link to that so yeah. people can see that. We'll absolutely throw those in the show notes, yeah. Yeah. So getting into the 1966 Batman movie and TV series, what's interesting is that it was done by Fox. So there's always been this Mm -hmm. whole legal wrangle on the rights that prevented it from getting the DVD release for the longest time, both the movie and the TV series, Mm because it was Fox. But Fox and Warner Brothers don't get along at all. Mm -hmm. And now Fox is owned by Disney, so that's going to be even better. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So the 1966 film was intended to be the pilot to the TV series, but production was delayed on it, so they ultimately didn't do it until between seasons one and two. Okay. There were also plans for a second film between seasons two and three called Batman in Outer Space. Oh, wow. (laughs) It never happened. Sadly. (laughs) Yeah, so the film was directed by Leslie H. Martinson, a very prolific TV director, Did, did a bunch of episodes of the show, did a bunch of episodes of Green Hornet. Didn't really do much films. I was looking through his filmography. He did The Atomic Kid Mm -hmm. about Mickey Rooney as a young guy (laughs) who just happens to be sitting too close to a nuclear bomb test. So does he grow giant? (laughs) I think he gets powers of invisibility and radiation, and it's a fun comedy. And then they did like a bunch of Hot Rod movies, like one literally called Hot Rod and one called Hot Rod Girls and all that stuff. Mm. And his only other big film to come out of this was Fathom. Directed by him, it was written by Lorenzo Semple Jr., who wrote this movie Mm. and starred Raquel Welsh, and it was Mm. a comedic espionage movie. It's basically like this movie. It's very campy, Mm -hmm. very colorful. Yeah. And then the writer of this, Lorenzo Semple Jr., who was the co-developer of the show, he was this incredibly... He was kind of the Akiva Goldsman of his time. (laughs) Okay. In that you would be surprised to see the properties that he got attached to, given the level of his writing. Mm -hmm. He did Fathom, Pretty Poison, Papillon, The Parallax View, Three Days of the Condor, King Kong, the 70s King Kong. Okay. Just terrible. (laughs) Flash Gordon. Okay. Never Say Never Again, the unofficial Mm -hmm. James Bond movie. Sheena, Queen of the Jungle, <laughs> the John Stamos espionage thriller, Never Too Young to Die. Oh, God, that's got to be bad. This guy became like a big summer blockbuster writer for no real reason. Kind of like Akiva Goldsman. <laughs> Just luck, I guess. Or kind of like Dan Waters, but Dan Waters at least made it funny. <laughs> we'll get to Dan Waters later. Right. There's not much to the plot of this film. It's all of Batman's rogues gallery, Joker, Penguin, Riddler, Catwoman... Is there anyone else? Joker, Penguin, Riddler, Catwoman. Just those four, right? For some reason, I'm thinking six. No, they did not bring Victor Buono as King Tut in to their detriment. No. They all hatched this plan to turn the UN representatives, I believe, or the World Council representatives into dehydrated powder. Right. And Batman has to save the day. Yes. So what did you think about the Batman 1966 movie? 
It's a lot of fun. It's very, very silly. I mean, you know, if you've seen the show, you kind of have a feel for what kind of comedy is involved. I feel like they probably should have cut the villains down just a little bit. Joker doesn't really do anything, as far as I can tell, except be there. And I'm sure we'll get into some of the depth of the plot. And- the Joker or Riddler, not both. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. There's a couple head-scratching things toward the end there, but it's a lot of fun. It's definitely the kind of movie I could see watching with like a group of friends and just laughing. And It's very, very silly, but it's a good time. It's a nice encapsulation of that show mm-hmm. as a whole. It's like, if you want to introduce someone to the show, show them this movie. Yes. And if they like it, okay, here's three more seasons of it. Mm-hmm. I did kind of drift away from the screen just because I have seen this film several times before. And some uh-huh. of the bits work, some of the bits don't. It's almost like a very sketch comedy movie. Right. It's a very loose story just comprised of sketches. And mm-hmm. some of the sketches are great. Like, some days you just can't get rid of a bomb. <laughs> right. <laughs> It's probably the best part. <laughs> I mean, the whole ending with the World Council getting swapped yeah. with their personalities was surprisingly hilarious, especially the way that Batman is just kind of like, well, we saved everyone. Let's get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> They spend all this time and I think Robin even suggests like, maybe we could fix them. And it's like, what are you trying to say, Robin? Yeah. And then Batman ends up accidentally screwing it up. It's just kind of like, right. oh, hey, everything's cool. I'm out of here. Yeah. Let's speak different languages now. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's bright, it's silly, it's colorful, mm-hmm. it's pure camp. Yeah. I love just how committed the actors are to not only Batman and Robin, but the villains especially. They just mm-hmm. chew that scenery like crazy. Oh, yeah. Frank Gorshin is fantastic. Oh, Frank Gorshin, Burgess Meredith. Yeah. Especially Burgess Meredith as the Penguin pretending to be <laughs> the Commodore. Right. <laughs> And Batman and Robin instantly seeing through it, but deciding to play along. Right. Schmidlap. That's gold to me, especially when he like reveals himself and brings out his henchmen and they keep playing along and he's like, oh, oh, Uh okay, let's keep running with this. (laughs) I think that Batman series worked better as a TV series because it was better in smaller doses. Yes, exactly. Because watching like an hour and 40 minutes of it does go on a little long. Yeah. I know it's probably supposed to be part of the silliness, but I was getting really tired of him not figuring out that Kitka was Catwoman. It was like, come on, dude, put the pieces together. (laughs) You can figure out Riddler's jokes in like five seconds, but you can't figure out that she's got her mask off. She's not the same woman. What I do like is that you actually get him as Bruce Wayne getting captured by the villains and still Mm -hmm. kicking their ass. Right, right. And I do kind of like, I don't think I ever saw it in the show where he would say something similar, but the whole... If any of you fiends lay a hand on her, I'll kill you all. Right, you know? right. <laughs> nice little punch there, surprisingly. Mm-hmm. I know it's infamous as a meme, but the whole helicopter shark repellent gag yes. just drags. It does, it does. Especially with having to wait for Robin to climb down the I ladder. Know, it's like, really? Like, you couldn't just gently toss it and he could catch it or something? But all the funny bits of, like, Adam West punching and kicking the rubber mm-hmm. shark. Well, and they've got barracuda repellent and <laughs> whale repellent. and <laughs> They're prepared. <laughs> They're prepared for anything. Anything, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, heaven forbid, you end up on an island where it's full of bears and wild boar and all you're stuck with is shark and barracuda repellent. I want that story. Well, you know, it's probably in a different part of the helicopter. It's fine. <laughs> Everything is everywhere. <laughs> mm-hmm. I love how ridiculous the bat poles are where they just flip a switch and it changes their costumes. Right, right. How? I want to see that. Now I can't remember if it was in Batman or Batman Returns when he slides down the chute. Yeah. I was like, that had to be a tribute to this, right? Like- well, I love how he slides down the chute, but then he goes and spends 20 minutes in a closet full of the exact same right, outfit. getting changed, yeah. I love that scene. We're getting ahead of ourselves, but I do love that scene. We are. <laughs> <laughs> I can see why it had the impact it did on pop culture. And what's interesting Mm -hmm. is the comics, other than maybe like the first year of the Bob Kane, Bill Finger stuff, which had a little more bite to it, a little more darkness to it, Mm. was a little more crime driven. Within a couple of years of the comic, they were already this. Okay, yeah. And throughout the 40s, the 50s, and the majority of the 60s, this is what the Batman comic was. Okay, yeah. 
Because remember, the Batman comic was the gigantic quarter. Yeah. Batman was a camp character Mm -hmm. throughout the majority of its life up to this point. Well, that's part of the thing you just have to accept. Like, he dresses as a bat and he scares people. Like, no, a guy in a bat costume is pretty ridiculous. Yeah. (laughs) In real life, you know? And then what's interesting is that right when this series happened was right when the comics were starting to change. Mm. New editors had come in. They were starting to allow the writers and artists to experiment a little more. I want to say it was like by 6970, it was when the Denny O'Neill, Neil Adams stuff began. And mm-hmm. even before that, like for a couple of years before that, there were several other creators who were starting to go back to the crime roots, take a little bit more of a horror angle to the villains, all that stuff. And like by the time you get to O'Neill and Adams, they've completely cemented that and are now going as this very character-driven, psychological, very Mm -hmm. horrific, dark story, which then recreated Batman to what he would then be for, I'd say, the last 40 years. Sure. And it's interesting that that wasn't really a part of the comics until right when this series came out. Right, right. Sort of a flip-flop to change his image or whatever they were trying to do, yeah. And then it's interesting that then, like, the fans who would come into it through the 70s and the 80s would then look back on this with score and saying, that's not my Batman. (laughs) It's like, hey, that was Batman yeah. before your Batman. <laughs> right, right. And I remember being a little bit snobbish like that yeah. for a little while, whether it's part of being a teenager or whatever. I think it helped that that was the first Batman I saw, mm-hmm. that I didn't have as much hatred towards it, even though I can sure. understand how some people were put off by it. Right, sure. Even as we're going to get into the Burton films, I think having mm-hmm. known that that was a style made me a little more open and aware of the campiness that they have as well. I think that's what the joke is, because I remember that was the whole thing of like, oh, the Burton films are dark and serious. Like, no, they're not. They have a dark aesthetic, but they're still campy. Right. They're dark in color. Yeah. <laughs> there's just some degree of darkness. But I mean, yeah, they're still very silly. No doubt about that. And we'll get into it more. Like Batman Returns, a lot of that movie, you could take that and put it alongside the Batman 66. And the only thing that's different is the color scheme. Right. Right. Anything else leap out to you about the 66 film that you want to talk about? I don't understand why Aunt Harriet was there for all of one scene other than just to say that she was there. <laughs> I think it's just because she was a character from the show. <laughs> oh, and I guess the other thing that was obviously, I guess they got a little bit more money. They're making a movie it was definitely a point of like let's have every single possible vehicle we can have yep. and show that off that was kind of fun yeah and that wasn't part of the original design that was just hey they got a bigger budget we can do it mm-hmm. let's do it <laughs> right right i love the penguin submarine too with its big flippers oh yeah that, the little flippers like it's actually swimming <laughs> yeah what do you think about like say caesar romero's joker well like i said you barely see him in this Like, he's just sort of there to tell Riddler to calm down, which is pretty funny, you know, but... (laughs) Ironic. (laughs) (laughs) But, I mean, I remember liking him a lot in the show, but he just, he doesn't have enough to do. I'm like, where's the big Joker scene? I agree. Like, I've always liked Cesar Romero's performance, and I always love Mm -hmm. the makeup design of the character, even with the mustache that's visible under the makeup. It's a good design to the character. Mm Mm-hmm. Frank Gorshin, I love Frank Gorshin as the oh, Riddler, yeah. but the problem is that his was the one who was making the Riddler and the Joker kind of indistinguishable as characters. Yeah. The only thing that made the Riddler different was he kept giving away every scheme because he had to put out his riddles, which has right. made a plot thread of this movie, which I feel if you had just <laughs> eliminated that, you could put more focus on the Joker. Yeah. And I love Burgess Meredith as Penguin. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. He's really good. I especially love the whole bit where he's sending the umbrella down the hallway with the knockout gas and then like the two guards who <laughs> fall into each other. So he just crawls under him. Yeah. <laughs> and then Lee Merriweather's Catwoman. She works as a kind of love interest foil. I like her little moment of don't call me that without my mask on or whatever Mm. she says, like that Catwoman is the real identity and she doesn't want it spoiled. My main thing is I just kept like, it's obviously Catwoman. Wake up, Batman. Wake up. (laughs) No, that's interesting. And seeing some early play on the identity themes that not only became Mm -hmm. like a big part of the Batman series, but kind of became a big thing of superheroes overall. Right. And then like Batman and Robin, there's no backstory, no no origin, which is not a good or bad thing. Mm -mm. It's kind of dropping you right in the middle of their adventures. Right. But they're pure Batman and Robin. They're like, holy cow and chum. (laughs) You know, it's basically (laughs) all they are is the hero and the sidekick. Yeah. I love that we even get a whole climbing up the wall scene, which was classic uh-huh. in the show. Yep. But yeah, Lee Merriweather, I thought she handled herself well. I know there was some controversy because it wasn't Julie Newmar, mm. who said she was surprised when she heard about the film because nobody offered it to her, but they said uh. they didn't offer it to her because she already booked up her schedule with other things. Okay. But yeah, Julie Newmar was the Catwoman of season one, then Lee Merriweather mm-hmm. happened, and then Eartha Kitt came in, I want to say either season two or season three. Okay. Lee Merriweather only really got this one opportunity to play the character, and okay. I thought she did it fine. But mm-hmm. yeah, the whole Miss Kicka romance was... 
Okay. Yeah. But yeah, there's not a whole lot else to talk about, like plot or character wise. It's just a lot of fun stuff happens. Exactly. It's definitely a recommend, but yeah. (laughs) Even with the punchline, the whole some days you just can't get rid of a bomb scene is so absurdly drawn out. Mm -hmm. Like, I love how often that band just keeps coming back. (laughs) The lady with yeah. the buggy and the kid. Yeah. And the nuns, the nuns and the duck with the little <laughs> ducklings and the lovers on the boat. And that band just keeps marching. <laughs> He's having everyone evacuate the club, but there's the two women who are just like, but we like these sandwiches. Exactly. We're eating. We don't care. <laughs> yeah. It's so absurdly. It's a great comedy sketch. It is a, a mm-hmm. legit, well-built comedy sketch. It escalates. It just keeps building and building. And then yeah. it just gets to that one perfect punchline. Some days you just can't get rid of a ball. <laughs> Which unfortunately resurfaced as a meme. I want to see even going back to the Joel Schumacher era. Oh, okay. Early days of internet. And is a good reference to bring up any <laughs> any time a studio is forced to release a bomb. Boy, yeah, you could do an entire sketch built around the attempts to get Dark Phoenix release, and then <laughs> finally it comes out. Yeah. Yeah, anything else you want to bring up on Batman's issues before we move on? No, I think that's it. I think we covered most of it. Let's go ahead and move to the 1989 Tim Burton Batman film, which yes. began development in 1979. It was Michael Uslan mm. and Ben Melnicker picked up the rights to that and then brought in John Peters and Peter Gruber. And I know John Peters has kind of become infamous in recent years because of the whole Kevin Smith story about the giant spider. Oh, okay. In Superman Returns, that was that producer. Mm-hmm. Okay. And John Peters got a start in the industry because he was Barbara Streisand's agent and boyfriend. Hmm. But he went on to become like a very successful producer with A Star is Born, Eyes of Laura Mars, Main Event, Caddyshack. Peter Gruber did The Deep and Midnight Express, and the two of them finally teamed up with American Werewolf in London. And Mm. following that, they went on to produce stuff like Flashdance, DC Cab, (laughs) Clue, The Color Purple, Clan of the Cave Bearer, Witches of Eastwick, Gorillas in the Mist. John Peters has continued to have a tie to the Batman license, both Batman and Superman. So that's Mm -hmm. why you continue to see his name as the executive producer, even up on like the recent Zack Snyder movies. Okay. They brought in Tom Mankiewicz. He was doing films like Spy Who Loved Me, Moonraker, What's Up Doc. And his big thing that led him to do this was he was the writer that they brought in to rewrite Superman. Okay. And then he kind of infamously rewrote Superman and Superman 2, but then they threw out his script for Superman 2, but then that original script is what's the Donner cut of Superman 2. Okay, yeah, yeah. He wrote a script and that script floated around for a couple of years. Irvin Kirshner almost directed it. Ivan Reitman almost directed it. Joe Dante almost directed it. Ultimately, it got to Tim Burton, who really liked the character and the aesthetic and wanted to do a Batman movie. He just hated that script. Mm. So Tim Burton threw it out. He had a couple writers bounce around. Even Steve Englehart, who was writing the comics, did a treatment for him. But ultimately, it settled on Sam Hamm, Mm -hmm. who was kind of new in the industry. He had only really done script work on a film called Never Cry Wolf before. He's kind of known for being one of these writers of a ton of unproduced scripts that have Um, circulated the internet that never got made. He did drafts of Submariner, Silver Surfer, a Planet of the Apes script that James Cameron was attached to at one point. Whole bunch of stuff floating around out there done by Sam Hamm. And sadly, okay. it's like the only things that ever got made were Monkey Bone. Oh, God. Okay. And a couple episodes of Masters of Horror, hmm. specifically ones directed by Joe Dante. And he did some really good ones there. And okay. the TV series Mantis. Oh, yeah. Which he created with Sam Raimi. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, he's one of those writers who's like kept working in the industry and almost nothing gets made. Hmm. I feel bad for him because I've read a bunch of his <laughs> scripts over the years and they're fun scripts. And then Tim Burton, this was his third movie. He was coming off of Pee-wee's Big Adventure and Beetlejuice. Mm. And it was only after this that he did like Edward Scissorhands and then kept becoming Tim Burton. Right, right. What's your overall exposure to and thoughts on Tim Burton? Well, I certainly watched Pee-wee's Big Adventure about 10 million times growing up. I was one of the many scared by Large Marge. (laughs) Oh, yes. Ditto. The shrunken head in the waiting room in Beetlejuice scared me so much, I don't think I finished that film back then. I absolutely fell in love with Nightmare Before Christmas. That's probably my biggest Mm -hmm. Burton film. But yeah, I'm a big fan of his style. I feel like he's kind of devolved into a parody of himself occasionally in later years. I think he needs to stop working with Johnny Depp full stop. (laughs) But I would say I'm a fan. Even when the new stuff comes out, I'm at least somewhat interested, even if I'm not going to fall in love with it. Yeah, same here. 
his rise as a filmmaker is basically a parallel of my life, you know? So it's like, mm-hmm. start with Pee Wee and Beetlejuice and Batman. <laughs> and then, you know, as you're getting into the 90s, you're getting into stuff like Ed Wood and stuff like that. Yeah. I've always found him a very interesting... I think he's a great artist. Mm-hmm. I really love the aesthetic and the tone of his movies, the Danny Elfman scores, the designs. Mm-hmm. He always does really interesting things visually. Yeah. I've never found him to be the strongest at story and character. Not that he He's terrible at it, mm-hmm. but it always feels half-hearted in terms of story and character. Like, that's just yeah. not really what interests him. Right. There is this mood and this gloom. He's interested in atmosphere. Absolutely. Atmosphere and aesthetic. Mm-hmm. And he's very good at it. And I don't think the story and characters in his films are terrible, but very rarely does one of his films, like, grab me and glom on to me. And I think, like, Nightmare Before mm-hmm. Christmas helped that Henry Selick right. was right. very heavily involved in that and a great Carol and Thompson screenplay. Mm-hmm. I think it says a lot that he gets a lot of very talented writers to work with him, but very few of them ever do it more than once. Because hmm, okay. he's one of those filmmakers who will just be like, no, nah, I don't want to do that. Do this instead. Gotcha. And like even then, Sam Hamm wrote the screenplay to this, and then Burton brought in Warren Scarron to redo chunks of it, who was hmm. one of the writers who worked on Beetlejuice and okay. also worked on like Top Gun Beverly Hills Cop 2. But then this was his last film because he died in 1990 at age 44 Ooh. of a heart attack. Oh, wow. Okay. Right when his biggest film came out. Yeah. Which is unfortunate. This one is, of course, the story of Batman versus the Joker. There's Vicky Vale. It's the whole mm-hmm. origin story of the Joker tied to the origin story of Batman. Yeah. Do you recommend Batman 1989? I do. It's weird. I like this film more the more I see it. I still have some issues with it here and there. But I do think while some of the mechanics, like the whole like tying their origins together, I feel is something that was very 80s to maybe early 90s was like an important thing to do. And now you wouldn't bother doing something like that. But in the context of the film itself, I think it works and it flows. And you were talking about aesthetic and mood. It's very gorgeous and it's dark palette. I like this Joker a lot, which is funny because I used to not like him. I think Vicky Vale is a really good addition. Yeah, I do like this movie. I'm not in love with it. I didn't love it back when I first saw it in 1990, but I do like it now. Yeah. Yeah, I recommend it too. I think it does some great stuff with iconography. It's mm-hmm. lushly designed. So I think directorially, it starts rough. Sure. It starts out very clumsy at times, but it's an interesting film that I think the first half hour is really clunky and rough, but as it goes along, it picks up steam and it really does find its footing. Mm-hmm. I think the story is still kind of choppy and they'll just take these giant leaps over plot or suddenly something will just happen. Yeah. Suddenly Joker has $200 billion and access to every <laughs> chemical plant in the entire city. <laughs> sure, why not? It's silly. But I think it also does root it. I think it's a decent character Mm -hmm. study of Batman. I actually don't mind what they're doing with the origin story. I know there's a lot of controversy about should Joker have an origin story? And I'm like, sure, Mm -hmm. just not one. Yeah. And I think this one, as an origin story on its own, it works. I think Mm -hmm. the character works. I love Jack Nicholson's performance. Mm -hmm. I really like Michael Keaton's performance. I think it's not a bad movie. It's just, it's a little clunky and all over the place, but it really nails a lot of it well. Mm -hmm. Mostly I just have some specific technical problems with it. And a lot of that's in the first chunk. Yeah, well, I did notice, and I guess, I don't know if that's fan service for that time, but it was definitely like, look, a Batarang. (laughs) <laughs> look, the Batmobile. Like, it was a yeah. lot of, look, he's spreading his cape like you've probably seen done in the comics many times. Those were the worst shots of him spreading the cape. Yeah, it was like, okay. And they did that a lot. <laughs> yeah, and you just know, like, man, that had to be a real pain in the butt for Michael Keaton to wear. That did not yeah. look comfortable no. at all. <laughs> I mean, that's the biggest <laughs> takeaway is, man, Michael Keaton could not move his head at all, could he? <laughs> No. And there's so many bits in the movie where he has to look up and look down. And it's like he yeah. has to do like the full body tilt. Mm-hmm. That's the biggest thing is it didn't crack the mask. And even the sculpt of the mask, it's not terrible, but it is a little too bulky around the face. Right. And the whole trying to do the thick neck look, mm-hmm. that actor cannot move. Yeah. I'm surprised that they got some kicks out of him. <laughs> and then, yeah, just the whole dramatic bit of where he's just standing there and lifts up the sides of his cape. It, that's not working. <laughs> it's not yeah. working. <laughs> No, it's not. That's basically what that entire opening... I mean, I kind of enjoy on concept that whole opening scene with the muggers, Mm -hmm. where it's almost a retelling of Batman's origin story, but now he gets to be the one to stop the muggers. Right. And the whole, what are you, man? I am Batman. 
Yeah, iconic. That's understandably become right. iconic, but a lot of that scene is really clumsy. Yeah. So what do you think about the origin story with Joker and Batman? Personally, I wouldn't prefer that. I feel like it's always a little too pat, especially for Batman, who's clearly an established character here. Like, it doesn't just have to be the same guy who's already in this film to yeah. give him purpose and meaning. But I do think it does work. I like the way that he turns his catchphrase back at him and it's creating this sort of loop between the two of them. It's not my favorite, but it works. Yeah. What I like is the way they, again, I agree in theory, Joker shouldn't have an origin, but if you're going to do it, mm. at least do it well. I think they do it well yeah. enough here. Because I mm -hmm. like that, yeah, he's that whole mob enforcer. It's the whole he gets dropped in the chemicals when the mob turns on him and Batman pushes him over. Mm -hmm. It's a nice spin on the whole Red Hood story while also making him a cruel psychopathic hitman. Right. I love tying him to Jack Palance because it's Jack Palance. <laughs> I love Joker doing an impression of Jack Palance. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> what I like about the tie to Batman's origin is there's still a meaninglessness to it. It's not like Jack mm -hmm. was intentionally targeting the clan. He was just a young hood coming up as a mugger who became an enforcer. Yeah. And I like the way they gradually reveal it. Mm -hmm. You know, Batman meets Jack Napier, then the Joker comes, and then he recognizes Jack Napier as the Joker, and then that's supposed to be like the big dramatic, aha, I've got you now. Mm -hmm. But then Joker just says that one phrase that instantly goes back to Batman's past as like, oh shit, oh shit. Yeah. And I love how hit he is by just suddenly revealing that, oh, this bad guy I've been targeting, mm -hmm. he means so much more now than I even <laughs> thought he did. And I like the way they did that. And then again, that he turned on him. He ever danced with the devil in the pale moonlight. Mm -hmm. And I like how he doesn't do it in a Batman voice. He does it in the Bruce voice. Right. So what do you think about Michael Keaton as Batman and Bruce Wayne? I like him. I definitely think he's a better Bruce Wayne in a lot of ways. He does that, not quite incompetence in this film as much, but I don't know. He has a nice, quiet depth to him, I guess, is the best way to describe mm -hmm. it. His scenes with Vicki Vale in particular, I think, really work really well. Yeah. Especially love the whole scene where they're at dinner mm -hmm. at that giant table. Yeah. <laughs> I like that it's kind of that Clark Kent befuddlement, but not as extreme. Mm -hmm. Right, right. He's more human. He's kind of more in the moment. Mm -hmm. He's charming. He is legitimately charming mm -hmm. and a nice man. Yes. And I love the relationship with him and Alfred. Honestly, my only problems with him as Batman are that he doesn't get to do enough character stuff as Batman. A lot of Batman is just visually driven. Yeah. He has very yeah. few lines as Batman. Very true. And we've already discussed some of the issues with the visual representation of Batman in this movie. Again, it's not a bad design, mm -hmm. but just the implementation, like the lack of movement, the cape lifting. Yeah, makes it clunky. Yeah, that's all stuff I don't blame Keaton for. Mm -mm. It would have been nice to just have more of the character of Batman. Because even when he's solving the whole thing with the chemicals, we don't really see him doing much detective work no. or really anything. It's just sort of like, here, give this to the press. Exactly. And there's yeah. a lot of this that Tim Burton just steamrolls right over. Yes. And it's like, I would like yes. to explore this more. I mean, the whole plot thread of the chemicals that are being mixed and everyone just stops using hairspray mm -hmm. and makeup and deodorant. And I love how that's envisioned by the newscasters suddenly the look news normal. People, right. Looking awful. <laughs> <laughs> but we never get to see like what's that like in the city as a whole right yeah as an entire city now stinks and looks awful mm -hmm. and i guess vicky vale had like already stocked up because she's not even remotely bothered by this and still looking gorgeous <laughs> what you mean that's just not her natural beauty <laughs> mm -mm. well maybe she just uses mayonnaise <laughs> maybe so for her hair at least going off on that what do you think about kim basinger as vicky vale She's really good. I like that she certainly gets into situations, but she's not your typical damsel in distress. She's assertive. Yes, absolutely. She's not just sitting there going, oh, save me, Batman, or anything. No, I like that she's obviously trying to become a much more serious photographer. And we get like little bits of that. It's not very deep, but we at least do see some depth to her character. Yeah, no, I agree. I like how much of the plot is driven by her. Mm -hmm. I like how she reacts to being brushed aside by Bruce. Mm -hmm. She's angry. She wants to see why. Sure. But then when she learns that backstory, she understands it, but she's still hurt by it. Yeah. I like that whole scene in the apartment where she's confronting him and he's confronting her. 
Maybe a little bit less with him pushing her down and saying, shut up. Yeah, yeah. Jack was watching it with me. And when he did that, he goes, the 80s. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, like this was not okay now, but at the no. time, yeah. But what I like is that there's obviously a connection there. Mm-hmm. It's a shame that they weren't able to keep building on this in subsequent films that they actually were planning to. Vicky Vale was supposed to come back to the sequel. Okay, yeah. That is my biggest frustration with these movies is that he falls in love every single time and then the woman is mysteriously gone. Yeah. Yep, yep. And not even that she dies. It's just that, oh, we never picked that up again. It's like the Karate Kid movies. It just didn't work out. Yeah, with Daniel's girlfriends. Mm -hmm. You have a film where you build it up and say, oh, yeah, this is the one true love. Right. It's like, oh, crap, that actress got booked on another show. (laughs) I like the romance. I like the build between them because I like that there's a lot of problems a lot of conflict Mm -hmm. a lot of he doesn't know should i open up and tell her things it's a little fast but he's like i feel like she should know and the whole thing where she just figures it out and just comes into the bat cave (laughs) (laughs) well does she or is it that alfred brings her because alfred thinks he needs somebody that's a good question I don't know. Because in Batman Returns, at least, he makes the joke of, I'm not the one who brought Vicky Vale into the Batcave. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. So I think it is technically Alfred's deciding to reveal it. But I like how much of the conflict is not about your Batman as who are you? Right. I think that's something that gets reflected well in Batman Returns is the whole mm-hmm. mass and identities thing. And yes. I think his conflict of, hey, I'm starting to fall in love, but can I marry that with my mission? Mm-hmm. Which is, again, always an interesting thing about Batman. And traditionally, it's like the only real romance is in Batman's life. There's been Vicky Vale, who's the reporter. Mm -hmm. There's Catwoman, who's the villain. And then there's Mm -hmm. Talia al Ghul, who is like the major villain. Those have been like the three major romances of his life. And they're Mm -hmm. all conflicted in how they overlap with both sides of Bruce Wayne and Batman. Mm -hmm. And I like how they capture that here. There's a conflict. Yeah. It's not an easy relationship, but it's one that you can see both are gripped by. Yeah. So Jack Nicholson's Joker. Once again, talking about in the same way that Batman's costume doesn't work, I really don't like that prosthetic smile that they give him. It joins a little too much. I know obviously his natural lips aren't going to stretch in the same way, but when he's talking, it's so glaringly obvious that it doesn't connect and it looks really weird. And then, of course, they keep layering the other makeup on top of it so it looks even more Mm -hmm. awkward. It's really unfortunate because I love the costume when he's full decked out in the suit. I love his performance, but that prosthetic is just really distracting sometimes. Yeah, I don't hate it. I don't think it really robs from the performance that much, Mm -hmm. but it's unnecessary. Yeah. Especially when you have an actor who is known for his grin and his smile and how he'll just... Jack Nicholson is always smiling all the time. Yeah. And I think that would actually create a nice contrast to moments where he doesn't smile, even though he still has a smile painted on his face. And that was something that I liked about the Cesar Romero character was even in that Batman film, you have bits where he's frowning and angry, Mm -hmm. which are a nice contrast to the smile is constantly painted on his face. Yeah. It's okay to have a sad clown. Mm -hmm. Joaquin Phoenix coming October 2019. (laughs) (laughs) So much of that works. The costume, the makeup, Jack's performance. Mm -hmm. I know they paid him a ton of money and he was only on set for like 10 days, but man, did he give them their money's worth. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And he's pure Jack Nicholson and it marries with that character beautifully. I used to complain about that of like, oh, he's just being Jack Nicholson. Like, no. But yes, that's what it's... (laughs) Well, but he's not, you could put this side by side with Jack Torrance and you would definitely see a difference. You know what I mean? He's definitely turning it up in the necessary Joker ways that he needs to do. But he's exaggerating it. Yes. Yes. There's Jack Nicholson going full Jack Nicholson and Joker being pure Joker. That's a Venn diagram with a strong overlap. Sure, sure. I think that works as a choice. I think that's why they cast him is because just letting Jack be Jack would fit the Joker really well. Right. Sure. I love how they go all out with the gags, with the chat shattering teeth, the you wouldn't hit a man with glasses, the punch bean bag, the acid Mm -hmm. flower, the electric joy buzzer. Yeah. (laughs) Not so much joy, but yes, the electric buzzer. Right. He's an incredibly dark and brutal character, but it's like, yeah, they never really get into... Well, I kind of like that he makes his base access chemicals, but they never really get into how is he able to affect the chemicals in everything? And where did he get Mm -hmm. all that money? Did that money just come from the Jack Balance character? I would think that's probably what we're supposed to assume. And I mean, as far as the whole chemicals that, you know, they have to mention, oh, he was an expert in chemistry. Yeah, his whole backstory. Art chemistry. Art chemistry and... And one other thing. And now I can't remember what the other one was. 
was. So yeah, so he's able to do all of this. Okay, sure. Why not? Yeah, by mugging all those rich people, he paid his way through college with an art degree and a <laughs> chemistry degree. <laughs> Right, right. And I love that the story just drops that in there and just moves mm-hmm. on. Yep. It's like, here's how. <laughs> exactly. Don't think about it too hard. But I do actually like that he is the parody of the performance artist. The almost yeah. Lady Gaga-esque, it's like everything I wear, everything I do is a piece of my art. Right, right. Like the whole scene where he's crashing the museum mm-hmm. and just defacing everything and, and making yeah. it his own. And I like the one he's like, no, I like this one. Yeah. Leave it. <laughs> It speaks to me, yeah. <laughs> and it's a Giger-esque, you know, ribs right. and meat. Monstrosity, yeah. Even the whole thing of like when he leaves the apartment and then she sees Bruce Wayne is missing and she goes over to the box and opens it. And it's the spring out hand with dead flowers. Mm-hmm. I love that they just committed to, he is a garish, exuberant artist who is just committed to his own ego. Yeah. And the crime aspect is almost secondary to his art. Mm-hmm. It's pretentious. And that yeah. fits a Tim Burton movie perfectly. <laughs> Yes, yes. Getting into some of the darker aspects, there was that character, what was it, Alicia? Yes, I think so. His girlfriend. I mean, that's a really sad character. (laughs) Yeah, I know. I know. Poor thing. She doesn't even get to die on screen. She gets scarred and then throws herself out of a building. Yeah. Yeah. And then this was the film that made me a fan. There's issues I have with the character, but this is the film that made me the fan of Robert Wool. Mm, Okay. He's kind of unnecessary. He is. For a lot of it. And boy, does he hit on Vicky Vale a little too much. Who boy, yeah. But I mean, he's entertaining. And I like that he gets mm. to have a hero moment at the end, even though he kind of gets... I never found out if he died or if he was just knocked out. They never answer that. Yeah, no, they don't. The interesting thing about seeing just the growth over the course of the movie is, if you look at how badly staged the quote-unquote action scene is at the opening with the muggers, Mm -hmm. versus all the stuff in the cathedral where he's going through the goons, it's suddenly much better staged. Mm -hmm. The choreography is much stronger. It's more entertaining. I think you could see Tim Burton. I think he was a little overwhelmed at first, but you see him growing over the course of the film. Yeah, that makes sense. What did you think about like some of the action pieces and all that stuff? It was okay. Like, I don't remember anything, like, really... I know, like, there was that one goon that was, like, flinging the knives around. Yeah. To the point where I'm like, is this going to be the Indiana Jones moment? But Batman doesn't use a gun. Right. (laughs) But, yeah, I mean, I think brought to the fact that he can't really move that much in that costume. There's not a whole lot of things happening that are that exciting. When he's flying around in the bat wing or whatever you want to call it, with the balloons and things are a little more exciting. (laughs) than the fights themselves. It's better than a bad helicopter. Yeah. (laughs) I really love the big guy who's just kicking his ass, Mm -hmm. who is just like super into it and energetic and is like just (laughs) tossing him left and right and then clonking him with the bell. Like Batman finally gets in a lucky shot Mm -hmm. (laughs) and finally takes this guy out. What do you think about the fact that Batman kills? It's one of those things, I think, if you weren't paying attention, because I don't remember back when I would watch this as a kid and stuff, I never really thought of it. But considering that's his whole thing most of the time, I couldn't help but this time around when we were watching the movies, I'm like, okay, he killed that guy. Okay, yeah, he totally killed that guy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's just an action movie thing that they're just not thinking about it yeah. or we're not supposed to notice it. But yeah, it is a little strange considering his usual MO. I'm not someone who feels that you can't do a story where Batman kills. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that he's still not just indiscriminately killing everybody. Right. He's not full Punisher. Yeah. But I think he's someone who will kill if he has to. Mm -hmm. But that's not his ultimate goal. Right. Though I will say he does, at least in that one moment, he wants to kill the Joker. But I think it's at least justified with what we've seen so far and how he feels, considering how much he kind of ruined his life and made him where he is. Yeah. I mean, like, he didn't intentionally push Joker into the vat of chemicals. He actually tried to save them. A lot of the villains in the shop and even the ones, the muggers... Like the mugger, Mm -hmm. he intentionally left behind to tell the story of Batman, to spread the word. Right. In the chemical plant, he's like stringing people up for the cops to get. Mm -hmm. So he's not indiscriminately killing. Like the one goon that he killed by like clonking his head on the bell and throwing him down the tower is that guy was literally overwhelming him. Mm -hmm. And that was like the one shot he was able to get in. I can understand that. And then, yeah, wanting to kill the Joker, Mm -hmm. even though he ultimately, well, does he or doesn't he with the actions that he takes that leads to the Joker's death? I'm trying to think, does he try to catch him toward the end? I don't think he tries to catch him. It's just he wraps that thing around the guy's ankle and then him and Vicky are just sitting there. Yeah. It's not the typical, the villain killed himself as they plunged to their death. Batman actually did initiate the action, which caused him to die. Yeah. 
Because, yeah, he initially, he does try to throw him over initially. That's full-on murder. Yeah. But the Joker catches himself. And then, yeah, they tussle. And then, yeah, he falls, right? And it's one of those things. It does always bring up that question of why does Batman never kill Joker? It's like Joker is a force. Mm -hmm. What I like about this film is that while Batman has his personal tie to him, it's like Joker is literally such an overwhelming force that could destroy his entire city. He has to be stopped. Mm -hmm. And that's always been my biggest issue with that whole ethical argument of like, well, Batman won't even kill the Joker. Joker. It's like, he should try. <laughs> it shouldn't be easy and you shouldn't succeed at it. Yeah. But at some point you have to be like, this is such a massive wave of destruction that no matter where this guy goes, no matter what I do to try to stop him, he's always going to bring this wave of destruction. Right. You have to stop that wave. You're not going to save him or reform him in any way. Like Man of Steel. I didn't have a problem with Superman having to kill Zod as the only way to stop Zod from continuing mm -hmm. to destroy the city. I just don't think they executed it very well. Right. I don't have a problem with heroes who kill as long as they're not just doing it indiscriminately and they're not trying to do it like all badass like. Mm -hmm. Like even Punisher. I like Punisher when he's played more as an antagonist and he's more the dark mirror of showing how yeah. far heroes can go if they fall down that hole. Right. I mean, he does usually at least somewhat have a code. It's not yeah. always the best code. But it's like, I've never been that pulled into the Punisher stories where it's like, he's the hero and he's just going to wipe mm -hmm. out everybody. It's right. the Death Wish stories. Yeah. I like him when he is the example that other heroes use of don't become that. Mm -hmm. That's the necessary part of Punisher in the hero universe. And even Batman to a degree, it's like other heroes are like, man, Batman can really get <laughs> stuff done. I would never want to be him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's not a particularly deep film, but there's so much depth to, like, again, all the social mm -hmm. satire with Joker breaking into the pirate newscasts. <laughs> I love that they're, like, outside on the steps, but just because, like, they're looking in the monitor, somehow they all know to turn <laughs> <laughs> to look at it's it. It's absurd. And again, that's where it's, like, <laughs> yes. a lot of the absurdity of the original TV series is just being fully embraced here. Yeah, absolutely. It's a different aesthetic, but it's still just as absurd. Mm -hmm. I even love moments where it's, like, the Joker gets so frustrated he just kills Bob, his right-hand man, just for no reason. Mm -hmm. I know, that's great. He's like, Bob, you're my best man. And then, yeah, just because he didn't realize that Batman had a plane, yeah. he just kills him. <laughs> exactly. As if anyone would know. You a know. plane that has these mechanical grabbing claws <laughs> that have just enough spokes to grab each and every one of those balloons. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I even love like these two models were found dead. So Joker just keeps using images of those models in his commercials with like mouths animated. That's our mm -hmm. Joker. <laughs> <laughs> and even his goons are like these big henchmen in like leather jackets and biker glasses with giant boom boxes. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of, what do you think about the Prince soundtrack? <laughs> I'm just going to say I'm sorry to our good friend, Alexander. <laughs> That's the one thing I think doesn't work in this movie. I think those two songs stick out like sore thumbs. I just don't think they fit the mood that's been established at all. Yeah. <laughs> They're not bad songs. No. They just don't fit. <laughs> I don't hate the one used in the parade, mm. but the one that's in the museum is just way out of place. Yeah. It's such a bizarre choice. It's like somebody drew his name out of a hat and we're like, like, yeah, okay, we'll put Prince in the movie. I wonder if it was just simply because, hey, our villain's purple. Prince likes purple. I know. That's what I'm saying. Like, the only thing these two people have in common is the purple. I don't know. Could you call Joker's plot in this a purple rain? I mean, if you spelled it differently. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, especially, it's like, dude, you got Oingo Boingo right there. Yeah. I mean, like, the whole museum sequence set to Dead Man's Party would be so much more fitting than the movie that Dead Man's Party <laughs> ended up in, which was Back to School. <laughs> no, you put that in the Batman movie. Mm -mm. But otherwise, what'd you think about the Danny Elfman score, though? Maybe just between the animated series, which took the score and ran with it, and then, of course, Batman Returns, which we'll get to. It's actually fairly subtle yeah. overall, but it works really well. And that main theme mm -hmm. rightfully became iconic. Oh, yeah. Like, even before the animated series, it's like that hooked right. people, just that song, that da 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 playing mm -hmm. out over just the logo. Yeah. I do love this design of the Batmobile. Mm -hmm. What was interesting about seeing it against other cars was it's not very large. No, it's not. It's so low to the ground, but yeah, like just small too. Yeah. One other person I want to mention is Anton First, who was the production designer of this movie. Mm -hmm. He only did a handful of movies. His first big breakout was Company of Wolves, the Neil Jordan werewolf fantasy movie, mm -hmm. and then Stanley Kubrick's Full Metal Jacket. And then he did this film, won the Oscar for it, 
and was hoping to direct his own films, but had also started a medical treatment program that has since been banned because it's linked with causing paranoia and in 1991 Mm. committed suicide. Oh, man, that sucks. Yeah. And it's like he won the Oscar like the year before. Wow. And man, the aesthetic in this movie is. Oh, yeah. It's so weird and alien. It's very Giger-esque at times, some of those buildings. Yeah, definitely gothic. I mean, what's interesting is everybody talks about the Joel Schumacher films for the statues, but we already have like these giant statues, but through these hunched over sad mourning figures. And it's such a weirdly industrial alien city at times. Mm Mm-hmm. Wait, are those statues in Batman Returns? No, there's statues in Batman's Returns, but there's statues here too. Okay, because I just specifically remember the morning one in Batman Returns, but by the Christmas tree. Those are on the front steps in this one too. That's I think it's okay, the same location. So it's the same. Okay. But yeah, it's like these hunched over robed figures with their hands in their faces. Mm-hmm. It's such a striking aesthetic. It's a shame this guy never really got to go on to do anything else after this, because it's like mm-hmm. not even like Batman Returns looks like this movie. It's such a weird. And I think that's what really struck people is a lot of the darkness in this movie comes from that design aesthetic. Mm. I love how Axis Chemicals is this very weird thing, how it has like a thin base and then it gets wider as it goes up, like a reverse triangle. Mm. It's so odd. Yeah. Anything else you want to bring up about Batman 1989? I don't know if it's probably a fault of modern televisions. The stop motion animation was a little jarring and distracting. Like, I'm trying to remember because I know it's definitely when he puts the armor over the Batmobile yeah. is one scene. But then I think there was another one of, I don't know if it was his shadow or something. Or maybe when they were hanging from the building, they may have used some figures, some stop motion stuff. And it was like, wow, that looked really not natural. Yeah, I mean, like when they're hanging there from the building, that's just miniatures. But there was like this one bit in the beginning with the muggers where it's like this high overhead shot looking down from a rooftop you have this kind of animated right that was just kind of like a little rotoscope animation match shot Mm -hmm. there was another one in the back cave where it's like you have this little figure in the background in this giant back cave where it's like they're not matting it well it's not that it's a bad painting Mm -hmm. but it's not composed really well and the matte effect itself is not working very it kind of reminded me of certain effects in like the whiz Mm, yeah it's probably the kind of thing that maybe they just do for like a remaster to sort of clean it up. No, it I, I remember shots like that sticking out to me even when I saw it on VHS yeah, yeah. years ago. Yeah. I think it's just that was just the effects gradients mm-hmm. of the time. It's like, right. you know, in the 1980s and the 1990s had a lot of differences in terms of what they could do for effects. And it's like this was hitting right in the middle. Yeah. I didn't mind the armor plating so much just because it was good use of sound and editing. And I always loved that mm-hmm. design. It's just so ridiculous. It's like, <laughs> how is he able to drive with all that armor packed into the car? Right. But I also love this like, great video of the car locks itself in the armor and then just drops this little globe that bounces, bounces, bounces. <laughs> Boom. The entire place explodes. Yeah. Which talking about Batman killing everybody. <laughs> By the say, yeah, that's definitely another kill right there. Intentional yeah, for yeah. sure. It blew up the whole building. Yep. <laughs> oh, and then we should mention Pat Hengel as Commissioner Gordon, who was one of the major through lines through all four of the 90s films. Mm. Yeah, he doesn't get to do a whole lot here, no. but... I like the whole thing with he was totally aware of what Eckhart is up to and he can't get rid of him, but he knows what's up and he's kind of in control there. Yep. He's just a fun presence. Mm Mm-hmm. And he's not a bad play on, like, say, the 60s version of Commissioner Gordon. Right. It's nice that he became a through line. It's nice that Michael Goff as Alfred was also a nice through line to kind of anchor all four films. Yes. I love this Alfred. Michael Goff is fantastic. I love the bit at the party where he's just scrambling behind Bruce to, like, grab that glass, grab this thing. Mm Mm-hmm. I also love that whole scene with Bruce and the two reporters in the room full of armors. Right, right. As Japanese. How do you know? I bought it in Japan. Why does he have that? I I don't know, but it is a perfect billionaire. (laughs) Well, I think it's also, you can see where that's part of his research into how people used armor as a visual way to create fear. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I think they did a better job of it than he did. Especially the king of the wicker people. (laughs) Right. Also worth mentioning Billy D. Williams as the setup for Harvey Dent, which never really got paid off. Yeah, unfortunately. That would have been very interesting to see his version. Yeah, I think what's also unfortunate is that we never got to see the friendship between Bruce and Harvey. Mm -hmm. This would have been a good film to set that up. Right. But yeah, they don't really interact at all. They don't at all. He's just kind of there Mm -hmm. as just another town official. Yeah. So any final thoughts on Batman 1989? 
Well, just because you mentioned that, I do remember, is it the mayor, I think, keeps coming down on Harvey Dent, like, why can't you stop this crime wave? It's like, well, he's the district attorney, yeah. so you'd have to get him in jail, arrest him, charge him. What is the district attorney going to do? Yep. <laughs> It's like, I'm glad you keep reminding us that Harvey Dent is there and you're giving Billy D. Williams something to do, but yeah. <laughs> not the right role there. You should be coming down to Commissioner Gordon, <laughs> if anything. I think overall, it's a little clunky, mm-hmm. but for being like one of the first major superhero films in the wake of Superman and to kind of redefine superhero movies to this day, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, like a lot of like the costume designers and art directors who worked on this are still doing like Avengers and Pirates of the Caribbean and mm, all that okay. stuff. Like the person who did the costumes for this also did the suits in Dune, but is still working on stuff like Fantastic Beasts and Pirates of the Caribbean and stuff like that. Okay. I think it definitely established an iconography. It represented Batman to the world in a very interesting Mm -hmm. way. I don't think it's as separate from the 66 Batman as people want it to be. No, it's not. It's really not. It's not. I know people keep bringing up like Dark Knight and the Killing Joke. It's a lot more 66 than it is the Killing Joke. It's just a darker palette. It's yeah. not that much darker in mood. Yeah, it's got some blood from time to time, but it's still silly. Right. But I'm not saying silly in a bad way. People keep misinterpreting silly as being stupid. No, right. You can be cleverly silly and wittily silly, and this yes. is a very clever film. Dark comedy is a genre yeah. for a reason. You know, you can balance that. Yeah, and boy, wait till we get to Batman Returns. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Overall, I think this was a very necessary film in terms of superhero cinema becoming what it is. Mm -hmm. And I can absolutely see why there was Batmania back at that time and why this led to this whole... This led to Batman the Animated Series, which like revolutionized Mm -hmm. American animated television. Right. It grabs you. It sets an iconography. It sticks with you. Like I hadn't seen this film in 20 years. Even just thinking on it before I saw it, I was remembering Mm -hmm. almost every bit in it. Yeah. It's a good film. It's a very good film. Mm Mm-hmm. So that moves us to 1992's Batman Returns. Mm -hmm. So this went through a whole lot of plans. So back when he wrote the first Batman, Sam Hamm already had in mind a sequel script, which was going to be about Harvey Dent. And it was going to be about Harvey Dent and the Riddler, but then became Harvey Dent and Catwoman. Mm -hmm. Tim Burton came on and says, yeah, I don't care about any of that. I want Catwoman. I want Penguin. (laughs) And Sam Hamm was like, but we just set up Harvey Dent. And Tim Burton was like, I don't care. Uh, Because he's Tim Burton. That's typical of Tim Burton. Yeah. Sam Hamm wrote a script that he still gets story credit, even though none Mm -hmm. of that script was here. I've read it in the past. Mm -hmm. It's a very good script. It's Batman and Vicki Vale dealing with their engagement and getting married. Robin enters the picture. Hmm. Still a lot of character conflict. Catwoman is a basic insing style serial killer of men. Okay. And Penguin is just a crime boss who literally escapes from prison using pigeons. (laughs) All right. And they get glued together on this whole plot to uncover these. It's kind of an early version of the Court of Owls, where it's Mm. uncovering these falcons that lead to the hidden treasure of the founders of Gotham, which is part of a conspiracy that Bruce Wayne's father was involved in, and that ties to Bruce Wayne's father's murder. Okay. And it turns out the entire treasure is buried in the Batcave and nobody noticed it. Huh. It's not the best plot, but it is a well-written script. It would have been a very different movie, an entirely different movie. Right. But it was an interesting script to read, and that script is online. It's been online for years, and it's very easy to find. Okay. So that got thrown out, and then Tim Burton brought in Dan Waters. Yes. And I believe, Angie, you and I have mentioned Dan Waters (laughs) a few times in the past. Yeah, yeah. The Hudson Hawk coverage. Hudson Hawk, Ford Fairlane. Ford Fairlane, yes. Yeah, this is the guy who wrote Heathers. This is the guy who wrote Demolition Mm. Man. Mm-hmm. I love Dan Waters with every yes. fiber of my being. So good. He is one of the best satirists in Hollywood that everyone mistakes for a blockbuster screenwriter. <laughs> so he's written some of the weirdest summer blockbuster movies ever made. And this is one of them. Yes. Yes. And he got this gig because Tim Burton brought him in to do a rewrite of Beetlejuice Goes Hawaiian, hmm. which I've read. Okay. Dan Waters never did any work on that script because he thought it was the stupidest idea in the world. <laughs> But he ended up doing a pitch for Batman, and he was the one who was like, hey, remember there was an old episode of the TV series where Penguin runs for mayor? And it's like, hey, what if we build on that while also doing a satire of Batmania, where his script was more focused on how Batman has become this pop culture figure in Gotham with like action figures and merchandising and all that stuff. Mm. And like vigilante groups who were dressing up like Batman, which would (laughs) pop up in the Nolan movies. Right. And it's like an entire culture is built around Batman. And then he did the story of Catwoman where it was her 
Harvey Dent, and she was working in Harvey Dent's office. And so the Maximilian Shrek character was originally Harvey Dent. Huh. Okay. And her whole like electrocuting him at the end was what was then going to turn him into Two-Face. Turn him into Two-Face. Okay. And then Tim Burton brought in Wesley Strick, who was the writer of like Cape Fear, the remake of Cape Fear, and Wolf, and has written a lot of thrillers. Like in more recent Mm -hmm. years, he worked on Doom and the Nightmare on Elm Street remake and stuff that isn't very good. (laughs) I'm not a bad writer. I think he's actually a pretty good thriller writer. I like The Glass House. I like Hitched, which I think was his directorial debut. Mm -hmm. He's good at like nice little character thrillers. Mm -hmm. I would say like 60% of this script is Dan Waters and the other 40% is Wesley Strick. Primarily like the third act. The third act, they like threw out all the firstborn sons and rocket penguins and all that stuff. That's all actually Wesley Strick and Tim Burton. Okay. Okay. It gets back to Dan Waters with the whole Bruce Selena confrontation at the end. That's all Dan Waters. The Catwoman? Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. There's a lot of this movie is Dan Waters and a lot of this movie is Wesley Strick and Tim Burton. It's kind of all over the place. Anyways. Yeah. Do you recommend Batman Returns? Yes. Yes. This movie is like everything turned up to 11. It's Burton at 11. It's Danny Elfman at 11. It's Daniel Waters at 11. Mm-hmm. Danny DeVito is turned up to about 15. It's just so insane and intense and dark and twisted and funny. And Michelle Pfeiffer, oh, I love it. I love it. It's ridiculous. It still has problems with plot and things like that. But oh, such a fun movie. I love this movie. (laughs) This might actually be my favorite Batman movie, Mm -hmm. even more so than the Nolan films. I Uh really like the Nolan films, but I never get grabbed by this one. It's just so opulent. It's just Mm -hmm. so fantastical. But it is still grounded by some... It's so Tim Burton. Yes. The last one was like, Tim Burton has to work with the studio for the first time, (laughs) and the crew isn't really all of his regular people, so he's kind of like having to establish himself while also being restricted. And this one, it's like, they just set him free, and he's reformed his pack. (laughs) Yes. And they are just building this purely Tim Burton thing. And my God, Danny DeVito's Penguin, Michelle Pfeiffer's mm-hmm. Catwoman. I even really like some of the stuff they do with Bruce and Batman in this one. And yeah. Christopher Walken with giant white hair. <laughs> <laughs> It is so gothic and comedic and Edward Gorey-esque and Mm -hmm. the whole satire of Penguin running for mayor is so Dan Waters. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It's like so many of my favorite things all rolling into one. Right. I I see my favorite Batman. This is my favorite Tim Burton movie. Mm. It's just so purely reveling in its aesthetic and it is silly as hell, Mm -hmm. but it is so bitingly, wittingly silly and so twisted. (laughs) And I love love this movie. <laughs> Except for like the third act is a little clunky. Yeah. The third yeah. act doesn't quite hold together, but it doesn't destroy the film. Mm-hmm. And I think for as much as the whole Firstborn Sons and Rocket Penguins never really goes anywhere, <laughs> that's my biggest problem is that it never really goes anywhere and it just turns yeah. into, oh, Alfred Jam the signal again. Right. And like to me, a little bit before that, we're like the whole thing Penguin takes over the Batmobile. Like what ultimately does that solve? You know, like why is that even kind of there? Right. But I think what works is that I love ultimately the very end of Penguin's story and then the whole finale Mm -hmm. of Catwoman. Yeah. It is still a satisfying arc to end those characters with. And the whole journey to get there. The first act is wonderful. The second act is wonderful. Mm -hmm. The third act, it's a little fumbly, but it still sticks to landing. Yeah. And oh my God, the aesthetic of this film is so beautiful. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I should point out, this was Bo Welch. He brought back in Bo Welch as production designer. Bo Welch is the one who did Beetlejuice with him. Okay. And then went on to do like Edward Scissorhands. He became one of Tim Burton's regulars. Then he became one of the Coen Brothers regulars. And then he became the regular of Barry Sonnenfeld. And Barry Sonnenfeld and Bo Welch did the series of Unfortunate Events TV series together. Okay. Yeah. Bo Welch is even co-directing that series. Hmm. Okay. And he is one of the, again, like he does the Avengers. He does Pirates of the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And one of his first major films as a production designer, The Lost Boys. Okay. And right before he did The Lost Boys, Slow Burn. (laughs) Gotta start somewhere. So bringing Schumacher cast full circle. Yeah. (laughs) Never did anything else with Joel Schumacher, but yeah, yeah. (laughs) But I mean, I think he is one of the great visionaries in cinema and he melded, I mean, again, Beetlejuice and Edward Scissorhands, you can't get more Tim Burton than those. Right. And this fits perfectly within those. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the look and the aesthetic of this film? It's gorgeous in a very dark way. The clown gang, the gigantic duck that penguins always riding around in. 
Catwoman's costume. Oh my god. I love her apartment. Like both before and after. Right, right. I mean that hello there to hell here is such a small thing, but it works so well. I don't know. I love it. This is not anything like the real world at all, and it works beautifully. It is. It is pure fantasy. Everything is exaggerated. Everything is lush. But it's also a good use of black and white with occasional splashes of color. Mm -hmm. Everything has a very black and white aesthetic, and then suddenly that duck is so yellow, or something is very (laughs) red, or something is very green. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I love that whole abandoned zoo with a pool full of toxic water. The whole clown gang, and there's so many things to talk about in that clown gang. (laughs) What leapt out to you in in the whole circus gang? The poodle lady. (laughs) I love that whole thing of looking from that bad guy to that bad guy to that bad guy to this woman kind of looking at you flatly and looking down to the growling poodle. And she's like, eh, whatever. And then like, yeah, the dog, like... Uh, I love her. I love that she's the last one to abandon the penguin by just pulling back into shadows. Yeah, just disappears gently like, oh, man. And it's like, why is she even in the circus? I guess the dog does tricks. I don't know. She's the trainer. (laughs) The whole motorcyclist with the giant skeleton helmets. Mm -hmm. Vincent Schiavelli as the organ grinder with the machine gun. He's great. And the monkey. (laughs) It's such a great aesthetic. I love the use of the tumblers and the acrobats. I love the fire breather who gets lit on fire. <laughs> yeah. Batman's first murder in the film, I believe. <laughs> exactly. And he's dressed like a devil in an Oingo Boingo video. Mm-hmm. What did you think about Catwoman? Oh, Michelle Pfeiffer. I love her so much. She starts off so demure and awkward and shy and reminding me of my own worst moments in life. And then she becomes this like really almost like militant feminism. She really goes overboard in the hating feminine things, but also using her wiles. Yeah, I just love her whole arc and how she's struggling so much with her identity and how it works so well as a mirror of the whole Batman struggle. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Michelle Pfeiffer just brings so much to it. God, I want to hug her and love her forever. Right. I mean, (laughs) on top of being very much a man watching a very attractive woman in a skin tight (laughs) vinyl suit writhing around, (laughs) it is just a show stopping performance. Just the stuff that she's doing acting wise. Mm -hmm. A lot of this is Dan Waters writing. I think he does a great job with that character, that theme, bringing a lot of serious stuff alongside his satire. Mm -hmm. Again, the relationship between her and Bruce, I almost wish the film had explored that more because I think two of Mm -hmm. my favorite scenes are between her and Bruce, where it's them at the fireplace. Uh talking about their frustrations gradually fall in love but then having to leave Mm -hmm. that whole bit where they're making out and almost touch the things that would reveal to each other (laughs) yeah (laughs) but then i also really genuinely i think the strongest scene in the entire movie and that says a lot given how much i like this movie is the scene Mm -hmm. of them at the party yeah where it's a masquerade where they're the only people who aren't wearing masks the two masked avengers of the night are the only people who aren't wearing masks and they just have this scene where they come together and they connect. Mm -hmm. She shocks him with the gun and then he still stands by her. And then the way that it's revealed to each other that this is Batman and this is Catwoman, that revelation Mm -hmm. and the way that they're struggling with that. Yeah. I think what's missing from the movie is a beat following that. It takes too long before we follow up on that. Mm. And that the follow-up happens in the middle of the chaos of the third act. I mean, there's that whole scene where it's like, they're going to go walk together to deal with this. Mm -hmm. And then there's the explosion that happens, but they're both still in the same room. They're still like within (laughs) visible distance of each other. And yet they still never have a moment where it's just kind of like, we can't deal with this right now or something like that. Mm -hmm. There needed to be at least one moment to just punctuate that scene. But I love that scene so much. I love a lot of people criticize this movie for not having very much Bruce Wayne in it, being more Batman. But I really like the Bruce Wayne stuff that's in there because of the whole way it's a relationship with Selena. Right, right. Absolutely. I never felt like it was lacking because those were so strong. Yeah. And the whole final point where it's like, what's so sad is that she goes out not because of her lack of identity, but because she's now fully committing to this one. Yeah. She's finally fully committing to being the Catwoman. Mm-hmm. I even just love that. It's like just Michael Keaton just ripping the rubber mask off. <laughs> Bruce, why are you dressed like Batman? He is <laughs> yeah. Batman. You know. One, he's doing it in front of things like, come on. Like, it's funny because I feel like maybe it was in the animated series. They always stressed how important his secret identity was. Right. And in these movies, it's like, no, just lead Vicky Vale into the Batcave. Just rip your mask off in front of Max Shrek. Why not? 
But the other thing is, too, he clearly has black makeup around his eyes. Yeah. And then he rips the mask off and it's just magically gone. Well, you'll notice, though, in the <laughs> shot before he rips his mask off, he doesn't have the black makeup under his eyes. So it looks different. <laughs> convenient but yeah he just forgot to put it on that time <laughs> yeah <laughs> they didn't want him to have raccoon eyes i guess <laughs> oh imagine if he had <laughs> it's just michael keaton like fully committing to the seriousness of that scene with like this big smear of black mm -hmm. looking like pris from Blade runner <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. I love her character because there's such a emotional range to her character. She's sad. Mm -hmm. She's liberating. She's evil. She's heroic. Yeah. She's not an easy character to like pin down to like one emotion or one thing. And I like characters who are like that. Right. Right. She's such a broad character in the best of ways. Mm hmm. And then speaking of broad, <laughs> what did you think about Danny DeVito as Penguin? Oh my, like I said, he is giving 200% at yes. least. He's so over the top. And I was like trying to think of another role he's done where he has been this over the top before. Well, basically he just plays Danny DeVito all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's just going for it. He is so intense. And I can only imagine what it was like to always have yeah. that green goo spewing out of his mouth. Not to mention the prosthetics had to be uncomfortable right. too. But it was just like, oh my God. And then the way they did the fat suit, that's a very bizarre anatomy that they've given him. Right, right. It kind of reminds me a lot of the Shadow King and Legion, where it's mm. puffy in the weirdest spots. Right, you right. Know. Still very unnatural and just, yeah, he's so intense. But he's also such a pure Tim Burton character. The weird, mm -hmm. crooked, little odd man in the long, rotted fur coat with the umbrella and the top. Hey, he's a very Edward Gorey character. Yeah, definitely. If anything, I think the only one that was a little bit of a step too far in terms of grossness was the ink spittle. Yeah. And I think part of that's also just because it affected some of the delivery where it's like too wet and spitty. Right, right. It's like, if you just cut that out, I'd be fine with it. But then that just kind of makes it a little gross. Mm -hmm. But I mean, God, he committed to that makeup is one thing, but the way that DeVito committed to that character. Mm -hmm. And again, that he's a horrible little monster man that you can still <laughs> feel for because, yeah, he was dumped into the sewer by his parents who just didn't want to deal with it. Right. Is it something I've just decided or is it somewhere a detail and I missed it this time that he killed his parents? Ah, uh, ooh. I've always felt like when he's saying, like, I need to find out who I am, I kind of get the feeling he already knows who he is, and he's just using that as the excuse to take down the name. Oh, yeah, I believe he knows that, but I don't know if he ever killed his parents, but I, I like the whole backstory of where he has this whole history of disappearing mm -hmm. children around him. It's like, ooh. Right. <laughs> to me, I've always felt like he probably got his revenge on them a long time ago. That's a good theory. Mm -hmm. I would love to see that <laughs> confrontation happen. Yeah. He probably tossed them off the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> but then I love how his parents are played by Paul Rubens. Mm -hmm. And then the woman who was kind of the love interest in Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Yeah. The one that he met at the dinosaurs. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then I love that Gotham built on that by casting Paul Rubens as Penguin's father in that too. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's so twisted and so dark. Mm -hmm. If anything, I think the only bit that doesn't work for me is again, kind of like Knox is a little too bit of a sexual deviant. Yeah. Yeah. His hitting on Catwoman is particularly creepy. There's ways to to play on that dynamic without always just making it the horny fat guy mm -hmm. and then the whole enticing him to become mayor is like imagine how much pussy you'd get yeah yeah that was a bit much not really necessary and the whole like hey at least my nose isn't gushing blood scene <laughs> oh that used to freak me out so much as a kid oh I think bits like that, I could see why when this film came out, it did have a response of a lot of people were blown away by it. And a lot of people were like, mm. what the fuck did you just do? <laughs> yeah. I honestly think it's just stuff like that. It's stuff like mm -hmm. the perversity of Penguin, the right. nose gushing blood, the ink spittle and all that stuff. It's like, if you just tone mm. that stuff down, yeah. I think the rest of the film would play fine. Because you could still have that great moment where he's talking about killing the kids and the clown goes like, isn't that a little much, boss? <laughs> And like, of course it's too much. And he just shoots the <laughs> yeah. guy. And you know, even like the whole severed hand gag where it's like, hey, how's your mm. old ex-partner doing? Right. Hey, I'm Frank's hand. You know, that's at least played yeah. campy enough that it works. Mm -hmm. And then it has that fun punchline of the handshake. Right. Again, like it's a really ugly image, but the image of just the shattered, bleeding, drooling ink penguin rising out of that water for the one last moment mm. and then going up to the umbrella cage, it's like, shit, I grabbed a cute one. <laughs> yeah. And then he dies and then the 
this whole procession of penguins comes and leads him back into the water. It's like, yeah. that's really heartbreaking. It really is. Like, he's such a terrible character. He's been doing all these exactly. terrible things. But then he's like, oh, look, they're bringing him out to sea. Exactly. <laughs> you can see why Tim Burton wanted to do that character. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. Mm hmm. And then what do you think about Christopher Walken as Max Shrek? He's Christopher Walken. Exactly. <laughs> You know, it's not a huge deviation for him for most of his roles, but it's what he does and we love him for it. <laughs> yep. Yep. Again, just that shock of white hair. I love that his son Chip is played by the guy who played Zongief in the Street Fighter movies. They got this giant beefy yeah. bodybuilder to, to play this son. Is he like intentionally copying Christopher Walken's accent too? Or is that just his own? I don't think that actor is that good, but yeah. <laughs> I just thought that was really funny yeah. that they kind of talked the same. <laughs> like, oh, it runs in the family. When it was fun, because I'd never noticed that was that actor before. Because it's like, I've seen that actor mm. in tons of stuff where he plays like Zongief style characters, where he's the giant, goofy, muscle bound character. Sure, big muscle guy. Yeah. And it's like, I always remember the character of Chip. And like, I even read the Dan Waters screenplay a few months ago. And it's like, oh, yeah, it's Chip again. But it's like, Chip has mm. just kind of played like Trump Jr., basically. He's just the yeah. son of the rich guy. And then it's like, I'm watching this movie. I'm like, oh, wow. I didn't realize they got someone that giant and that beefy. I'm like, wait, <laughs> wait a s What is, is that Zongi from Street Fighter? <laughs> Quick, somebody change the channel. Mm -mm. I should point out, I love Street Fighter at the movie. <laughs> Obviously. But yeah, it's, it's like, I just thought that was an interesting against typecasting. And he was supposed mm -hmm. to be more involved in the third act. Okay. I didn't really think of anything he was lost. He's not a really mm -hmm. interesting character. There's not much to him. No. But I do kind of like that they do have a genuine father-son bond. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like the one person he seems to actually yeah. care about. It is a well-written movie. It's beautifully directed. The cast is just astonishing. Mm -hmm. I really liked it. I mean, even the Danny Elfman score really cranks it up. Mm -hmm. This is where they brought in the choir. Yeah. <laughs> you can tell he's gotten a little more confidence and ego. He's like, okay, I'm going for it. I'm going all the way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. One thing I want to point out, I never listened to the entire end credits before. There's like this one song buried at the end credits. It's in the scene when they're dancing, too. Is it? Yes. I never really actually sat and listened to the song before. But yeah, that whole Face to Face by Susie Sue, mm -hmm. co-written and produced by Danny Elfman. Okay, that makes sense. I mean, you just listen to the song on its own, and it's like, it is a Tim Burton Batman Bond theme, basically. Mm -hmm. It's like the type of music you would expect during an opening montage sequence. That was a much better fit than the Prince music. Yes, yes, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Anything else you want to add about Batman Returns? Shout out to the monkey trainer. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that little monkey was incredible, like seeing him come down the stairs and hand Batman's note to Penguin. And then when like Shrek gets him to come and bring the key and he takes the key and mm -hmm. the monkey has this like perfect shocked face, like, oh, I didn't think he was going to do that. <laughs> that little monkey was great. <laughs> What's interesting is this film is almost a little more gadgety than the original, especially like mm -hmm. the Batmobile is like really tricked out. And then the whole homing Batarang yeah. that you can program in like a video game controller. <laughs> but what I like is that this film turns Batman's gadgets against him. Mm. Like not only is that Batarang taken and used to frame him in a crime, but then the yeah. way they hack the Batmobile. The Batmobile, yeah. No, it was some good stuff. And, and this one, the mm -hmm. plates were CGI for the shield. Yeah, I noticed that. Got a little more budget. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, also three more years of computer technology. True. So yeah, anything else before we wrap up on Batman Returns? No, just go watch it if you haven't yeah. seen it in a while, because it's really good. <laughs> well, and then one thing I also wanted to briefly bring up, because I know both you and I have read it. Oh, the Catwoman? Is the Dan Waters Catwoman script. Oh, it's so, like, if you think this movie is zany and bizarre. Oh, that is, yeah. Catwoman is so much more. It has nothing to do with the comics, <laughs> no. nothing to really do with the character at all. I can totally see why it never got made. But yeah, that was quite a trip. Yeah. And it's this bizarre thing where it's like she goes to live with her mother in suburbia. And it's a town that, again, he took the whole mass marketing pop culture hero worship and applied mm -hmm. it to this whole team of superheroes who protect this town, all of whom are secretly the villains who are planning to destroy the town. Yeah. Catwoman is the reluctant anti-hero who now has to bring them down while also mm -hmm. dealing with more issues of her identity. Yeah. It's almost like incredible shrinking woman, like the whole Americana polyester satire. 
Right, right. Definitely a lot of the feminism commentary as well. And then it's taking the feminism commentary of this movie and then like running with it to a degree Mm -hmm. where it's like Catwoman inspires this whole feminist movement where all of the women in town don leather and at night just go on these giant riot sprees. Yeah. And it doesn't quite work, but it's also kind of amazing in the sheer spectacle of what it's trying to do. Right. I love the script. I'm not arguing it's great, but it's one of those scripts I would love to have seen someone film. (laughs) It's one of those ones where I can see why Tim Burton like looked at it and was like, no, that doesn't fit me. Yeah. But here's something I'll say honestly is instead of Batman movies, if you would put Joel Schumacher on that screenplay. Well, yeah, considering what we've seen with Incredible Shrinking Woman. Yeah. Even just looking at like the stuff that he did with his Batman in terms of like the scale and aesthetics and all stuff. I would love to have seen Joel Schumacher direct that Catwoman screenplay. Mm -hmm. I would legitimately like to have seen that happen. The colors would have been amazing. Yeah, Yeah, a gigantic polyester superhero movie. Where the one hero is the black vinyl clad Catwoman. Mm-hmm. And it's this whole teardown of Americana suburbia and pop culture consumption. And it's like, we mm-hmm. haven't even gotten to the Schumacher Batman films yet. But I think mm-hmm. the only thing that's really missing from them, just in thinking about them from the past, imagine what they had been like had Dan Waters stuck around. Oh, man. I wish we had gotten a Joel Schumacher Dan Waters movie. That would be, yeah. I think the garish scale and silliness mixed with the biting wit and satire, I think those two would have really gotten along well as filmmakers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, man. I think that's a missed opportunity is that we didn't just put Joel Schumacher on the Catwoman movie. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so I think that's the note that we're going to end on. We'll be back with Batman Forever yes. soon, which is going to be my first time seeing that in like 15 years. It's been a little less for me, but it's still been a while, so I'm looking forward to it. Good night, everybody. Good night. For additional episodes or to leave a comment, please visit schumacast.blogspot.com. That's S-C-H-U-M-A-C-A-S-T dot blogspot dot com. Schumacast can also be found on Stitcher. Our opening song, Letter, and our closing song, Vein Blossom, were created by Jack Locke and are used with permission. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Schumacast is in no way affiliated with Joel Schumacher or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. 